and vote and believe in whatever feels in line with your interpretation of the dilemma, but don't let that like lock you down or don't be like, I have to live exactly like Aleister Crowley because that's just, just ridiculous. On Crowley, people have a lot of opinions on him in the Philemon community and we don't all agree. So this is the thing. I think a lot of people think that Thelemites are like really into Crowley and that's true. I mean, I've made countless memes about the guy. I've read the biography of his life. I find him deeply fascinating. I'm very inspired by him. I've made videos on him. But as I said earlier, Thelema is about your own true will. Your true will is not to do what Crowley wills, right? Like he lived in line with his own will. One person's will is not going to be your will. We're not do what Thelema says, right? We are independent thinkers. We are critical thinkers. We are asking questions. We are seeking divinity. We are not just blindly doing what Crowley said or did. So if you live your life trying to LARP as Aleister Crowley, which a lot of people do, they like do all the drugs he did. They try to be super promiscuous or whatever, uh, which I have a lot of thoughts on that. I don't think that's why we should honor Crowley. I think we should honor Crowley for his ideas, not his sort of hedonism. Uh, because I don't think hedonism and Thelema are the same thing. I actually think hedonism in a lot of ways can block people from their true will in a lot of cases because they just get so into hedonism that they forget about the whole purpose of Thelema, which is to follow your true will and then to live in line with the great work. Like that's that's a different conversation. But basically, like people try to larp as Aleister Crowley, and that's just not what we are. He is not a perfect person, okay? He did some things and said some things that are messed up. Uh, I've tried to defend some of them, and some I will never defend. He was an individual. He was a single person. He was not perfect, and he was not the devil, right? He was not some crazy evil man, and he was not a saint. But he had brilliant ideas, and he started the religion that inspires all of us, that has changed me and so many people's lives. So for that, we need to respect him and give him the respect that he deserves. But we are not role players, and we are not trying to be him. In general, Crowley is nuanced. He is not black or white. He is a complex historic figure. And if you want to make up your opinion on him, you should read his biography. I really like Pierre de Warbo. That's probably the best uh, biography on his life. And then make your own decisions. Within Philemo, we actually have a big debate on where he falls within the religion. Some people recently have been trying to, like, eliminate Crowley from Thelemic discussions, and some people recently have been like, no, we have to recognize him. Junk fees. It really seems like companies have become addicted to junk fees, and it's making companies billions of dollars richer. Giving culture has gotten out of control. There are people who argue 20% is kind of a cheap tip. People like free shipping because the word free is very powerful. It's not really free because someone is paying for it. You're being guilted into shipping on something that is not technically a service. Someone's simply doing their job. Last time you purchased something and you weren't asked for a tip. Yeah, I can't remember either. Tipping culture has gotten out of control. I get to the pay window and she's like, how much do you want to tip? What am I going to tip you for? I'm in the drive through Oh my god. Tips have been on the rise for decades. During the 1950s, people commonly tipped 10% of the bill. By the 1970s and 1980s, that jumped to 15%. Today, People tip anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. According to one 2022 survey, consumers said they tipped more than 21 percent on average. Nowadays, there are people who argue 20 percent is kind of a cheap tip. While the percentage that consumers are tipping at full-service restaurants in the past couple of years has remained about the same, in the fourth quarter of 2022, the number of tips provided at full-service restaurants grew 17 percent. Meanwhile, the tip frequency at quick service restaurants, such as coffee shops and fast food chains, rose 16% during the same time period. What we're seeing now nationwide 
is something that is known as tiflation. At every opportunity, we're being presented with a tablet that's asking us how much we'd like to tip. In many cases, not only replacing the old-fashioned tip jars that you could feel good about throwing some spare change into, but actually suggesting tip amounts, often right in front of the employee receiving that tip. Not to mention also your dinner date and the dozen or so people standing behind you in line. And it's gone beyond just the tablets. The other day I was using the Hopper app to book a hotel, and it wasn't until I confirmed my payment that I realized my hotel is $10 more expensive. It turns out Hopper assumed I wanted to add a tip, and I had to go back to a prior page in order to opt out. Tipflation refers to not just that we're tipping more, but we're tipping everyone for everything. You're being guilted into tipping on something that is not technically a service. Someone's simply doing their job. In those situations, consumers are feeling resentful. Where do you draw the line? TIP stands for to ensure promptness. Tipping may go back as far as the Roman era, but according to most experts, the practice likely has its origins in medieval Europe. Noblemen taking passage on roads would throw coins to the rubble to ensure safe passage. One theory is that it evolved in eating and drinking establishments as a way to forestall envy. That when you're eating and drinking, you're having fun, and the people who are serving you are not. Fast forward to the 19th century, when waiters who received a full wage went on strike demanding higher wages, they were replaced with women who employers could pay less. A decade later, there was the population of newly freed slaves. The idea from these restaurant owners was that they were giving the luxury or privilege of a white person's tips. That was without a full wage. Ironically, as tipping exploded in the United States, it became less common in Europe and was replaced with service charges. While the first federal minimum wage law was passed in 1938, it wasn't until almost three decades later when the tip minimum wage was established. In 1991, the federal minimum wage for tipped employees was set at $2.13, which is what it remains at as of March 2023. As far as I know, the United States is the only country that exempts tipped workers from having to receive the full minimum wage. In 43 states, it is legal to pay tipped workers less than the standard minimum wage because tips presumably make up that difference. In recent years, you might have found yourself asking, do I tip this barista for pouring that hot coffee? What about when I'm going to a restaurant and picking up takeout? And how much do I tip that doorman, driver, or dog walker? When those in the service industry were feeling the brunt during the coronavirus pandemic, consumers started tipping for things they never had before. And the percentage of remote transactions when tipping was an option in which the consumer tipped soared from about 46% before the pandemic to around 86% in January 2022. If people were willing to tip the person delivering food to their home 30%, why not ask if they'd like to tip when they come pick up? During the pandemic, businesses who lost a lot of traditional customers and transactions were looking for alternative ways to make up that income. And if asking for tips was one way to do it, they were willing to try it. And since then, that ask hasn't dissipated. Another reason consumers say they feel pressured to tip more? They're being asked to tip prior to service completion. Asking for a tip beforehand is almost like a bribe, right? It's, I'm afraid not to tip because, well, you do less good work. Customers might not be concerned about the barista's perception of their tip before getting their latte, but what about the mechanic repairing your car? I don't know about you, but I'm certainly going to make sure to tip them well to ensure my safety. Another reason consumers are tipping more? Newer technologies. Kiosks and tablets with three large tipping suggestions that pop up on the screen in front of you. Three options chosen by the business. I have not yet 
been to the restaurant where they recommend 5, 10, or 15% for quick takeout, it normally always starts at 15 as a bare minimum, sometimes even starting at 20, 25, and up to 30. According to a 2022 creditcards.com survey, 22% of respondents said when they're presented with various suggested tip amounts, they feel pressured to tip more than they normally would. They use those options as an indication of kind of what the normative range is and feel compelled to tip within that range. So the more you ask, the more you get. The three prominent companies with that trendy, sleek look are Square, Toast, and Clover. They launched a bit more than a decade ago to help businesses run smarter, faster, and easier, all in one point of sale or POS systems. In some cases, fewer fees so it's less of a burden to accept multiple credit cards, no long-term contracts, and multiple other useful tools, including inventory and employee management. They got credit card processing into the hands of individuals and very small merchants. Square did a great job. It has been a tremendous growth story. That's half of the business today. Do you think these companies are responsible for this turn of events that we've seen with tipping? I would say they could take some of the credit for helping restaurants gather more tips. Robert Sanchez manages Eli's Essentials in New York City. One of the business's locations uses Toast, while the other uses this. He says the storefront that uses Toast sees more and higher tips. The Clover Square and Toast terminals to a consumer are very easy to use. Big buttons, big areas to sign the tip, an easy way to tip a different amount if you don't like the starting at 20% option. There are others that do it, they're just not as uh, cool looking. We've come a long way from being able to just throw your spare change into the jar by the cash register. The new tablets have turned what used to be a sin of omission, I simply didn't put money into the tip jar, into a sin of commission. I have to hit a button and say no tip. I have to actively choose not to tip, whereas before, not tipping was a kind of a passive thing. Glancing at the tip jar could have also been a way to get a sense of how many others are tipping on that service and maybe even how much money. Meanwhile, not only can the tipping options be customized, but the tipping feature can be disabled as well. So, it's the merchant's choice to ask or not to ask for tips. From the business side, it makes employees want to perform better and do a better job. It's seriously significant. It really pays for the software. You'd be a foolish business owner not to install it based on what the numbers display. Even a mammoth company as large as Starbucks has decided that they need to sink or swim, and, and the best way for them to do that is to use an offer that's Starbucks rolled out the tipping feature in stores in September 2022. It's one thing to have a happy staff. It's another thing to have customers that are feeling resentful. I think it's a calculus that all business owners really need to make. Do you think that they're somewhat going to start seeing that they're getting lower tips because people are paying tips to so many services or they're resentful of the act of tipping in general? I think that's a very real danger for servers in a sit-down restaurant. They were greatly affected during and immediately post-pandemic by restaurants doing all sorts of fees. Their tips were actually going down because consumers were saying, well, if I'm paying for the health insurance and I'm paying for inflation and I'm paying for this and I'm paying for that, enough is enough. The more you levy these line items onto consumers, guess who's being penalized? It's the one area that's still quasi-discretionary, which is the tip. I went door to door talking with waitresses, bartenders, and baristas, and while they wanted to remain anonymous, they told me it's happening already. With inflation and being prompted for tips left and right, they say customers have already started to tip less and sometimes not at all. A 2022 study found that 17% of Americans are tipping less because of inflation. However, 10% report tipping more. At the same time, more than half of Americans, or 60%, want to do away with tipping entirely. The extent of pandemic influence generosity has also gone down. 43% of consumers typically tipped servers 20% or more in 2022, compared to 56% of consumers in 2021. Meanwhile, the average tip for full-service restaurants has gone down only slightly during the same time period. According to Toast, 19.6% in the fourth quarter of 2022, compared so to 19.8% in 2021. I have, I have bar soap. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't have any more... Uh...
Ja. However, according to surveys conducted in those same years, respondents set them to be higher percentages, 21.2%. I washed my hands, and I was wondering why my hands still smelled, and I went to check it. You have too much water. You're both putting ourselves a danger because we're carrying germs from the toilet or whatever in our hands. No problem. Sure, be. Thanks. How so? and 18.9% respectively. It can genuinely hurt the people who truly, truly rely on gratuities for their livelihood. I firmly believe that the tipping invasion we are experiencing right now, I think it's a net negative for society. And with that tablet at just about every counter, no matter where you go, the question is, where's the tipping point? I'm wondering how long before I'm tipping my doctor after an annual physical. If you want to seem especially generous after an exceptional meal, you might decide to go big and tip 30%. But it's a cycle. As more people seeking to make a good impression then up their tips to 30%, maybe even 35%, what becomes a generous tip? I have to believe tips are going to go up from where they are today. But I also think there's got to be a logical ceiling somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Nearly $65 billion. That's how much money is lost to this deceptive American practice. Junk these. This really seems like companies have become addicted to junk fees, and it's making companies billions of dollars richer. 
across industries spanning banking and telecom to entertainment and hospitality. I stayed at a hotel. I asked, are there any extra fees? They said no. The bill on the last night, we were charged a $40 a night amenity fee, but even crazier, a $1 mandatory charity donation. I looked up the charity. It's a charity that goes back to the hotel. These fees are more than just annoying. The White House says they weaken market competition, raise costs, and ultimately drain the wallets of Americans. The very entity that's creating these fees are the ones telling you, well, we have to charge them. Their investors and shareholders really like it. It's another way to pull in more revenue without really competing, unless we do something about it, is just a race to the bottom. Some changes are happening, but the question remains whether any of the new policies and regulatory oversight will actually be enough to squash junk fees once and for all. Junk fees are basically an additional cost that has little to no added value. It's a junk fee. You know, junk fees are fees that sometimes provide no service whatsoever and are not subject to the normal forces of competition. There are so many different kinds of these hidden fees, so let's categorize some of the biggest offenders into three different buckets. Bucket number one, banking fees, like overdraft charges, late fees, or fees to pay a bill, or even account maintenance fees that you might get hit with after easily signing up for a new bank account, a charge for using that service every year. We could even count student loans in this bucket. Just before the pandemic, we found that banks charged about $15.5 billion in overdraft fees in just one year. And many of those fees were ones that actually could not have been avoided. It, it isn't just unfair in many cases. It's unfair. And banks are cashing in. Fees worth nearly $24 billion were charged by card issuers in 2019. And most of that, $14 billion, came from late fees alone. We estimate that the credit card industry levies about $120 billion in fees and interest each year. And that number might be even going up given the rise in interest rates. Bucket number two, fun fees, or the fees that you might incur when you're hopefully doing something fun, like buying a concert ticket, booking a flight, or a hotel. For example, resort fees might be added for your use of amenities during your stay, even if you're not using the... gym or the pool, and even if it's not a resort. Junk hotel fees and these ancillary fees at hotels bring in about $3 billion a year for the hotel industry. Lauren Will founded Pool Resort Fees in 2016 after a vacation in Florida. Even though my receipt said paid in full, I couldn't get the key to the room unless I paid an extra $20 in the name of a resort fee. And so I started the website. Hotel or resort fees can be anywhere from $20 to $70 per night. Many sites don't display these extra costs in the advertised price, so people can't comparison shop. The same thing happens when you buy a plane ticket. A lot of times people don't realize they're booking the lowest economy fare that doesn't allow them to bring a suitcase. The same goes for entertainment fees. It's when you try to buy a ticket to go see Taylor Swift. No price gouging! Off the record, my wife calls me a Gen X Swifty. Are you sure you want that off the record? <laughs> I do not mind. Yeah, I'm a very comfortable place in my life. I love Taylor Swift. For your fan to make six bucks out of a $42 ticket price, yeah, that doesn't feel good. Doesn't strike me. The Government Accountability Office found that, on average, ticketing companies charged fees worth about 27% of the ticket's face value. And then bucket number three, home fees, from buying a house to having a car and getting internet at home. This includes closing costs and other fees that come up when you're trying to buy a home, like extra fees for document preparation or title insurance. Then there's your cable and internet junk fees. A multi-billion dollars 
in revenue for the cable company to keep breaking out these fees, and they're mandatory. Including CNBC's own parent company, Comcast. The cable, internet, and cell phone companies can charge you 200 or more if you decide to switch to another provider. Give me a break. It can also be a violation of marketing. So if you look at the fine print, they're like to maintain our high-speed fiber network. And you're like, okay, so you have to charge me an extra seven bucks for the internet. The fall economic statement is. You need a one thirty, right? Yep. Okay, so let's go, my children. It's also okay. All episodes now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Is the best way to get investment advice over the phone? That's for me. Jerry does everything online. Everything. Bebo gives you personalized advice online, in person, and over the phone. Whatever best fits your style. <sighs> Confidence is a good look. economic statement is out and now come the questions over whether or not the government delivered on what it set out to achieve. Finance Minister Christian Freeland faces pressure to address affordability and Canada's housing crisis while not adding to the inflation problem in this country. The economic update pegged the deficit for the current fiscal year at about $40 billion, the same as the budget projected, but the deficit over the next few years after that is now bigger than forecast at budget. The cost to pay Canada's debt also rises due to that deficit and higher interest rates, reaching more than $60 billion in 2028. This is someone who's doubled our national debt. He's added more debt than all previous prime ministers combined. We're, next year, we will spend more on debt interest in Canada than we do on health care. There are also some new measures for housing, $15 billion in additional loan funding for rental apartments, but that money won't be available for another two years. Plus, proposed tax measures to crack down on non-compliant short-term rentals and a new Canadian mortgage charter, a codification of rules and expectations banks are expected to follow when working with borrowers, though it's not binding. What the Liberal government has announced is not a budget, obviously. It's not even a mini-budget. It is a micro-budget. It does not meet the urgency of what Canadians are going through. It doesn't really meet their needs. Mr. Freeland is Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. Hi, Minister Freeland. Pleasure to welcome you back to our studio. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Canadians are looking at the choice right now of your party and other parties, the opposition daily, knowing that there could be an election in two years or sooner. You have, throughout your mandate so far, launched some really big transformational spending initiatives that come with big tra uh, price tags but have had big societal impacts as well. Do you anticipate launching any more of those types of programs in the rest of your mandate? Um, I learned during the NAFTA negotiations, never answer a hypothetical. Um, there is a lot of time between now and the next election. But I am glad that you point to the big transformational programs that are already underway. Um, <laughs> My favorites is early learning and child care. We announced that in the 21 budget, and it is rolling out. And, you know, I think it is important for Canadians to recognize that our economic plan is something that is happening every single day. And, you know, it can be announced in a budget as with childcare in 2021. We are investing in it right now and it's delivering for Canadians with, you know, we now have fees down by 50% across the country. Six provinces and territories have $10 a day childcare. And that is really transforming families' lives. It's making life more affordable for families across the country. And it means a lot of parents, especially mothers, can now go out and yeah. that helps our economy with labor shortages and it helps yeah. families. And, and trust yeah. me, I'm not disagreeing with that point. It's actually with that program in mind that I asked the question. That program, something like the Canada Child Benefit, they do come, however, and not to take not to take away from their effectiveness or their impact with very large price tags, right? We're talking in the neighborhood in each of those programs of ten to twenty billion dollars a year. Child care is thirty billion over, over five. Right, that's a lot. It's a lot of money, right? So, so 
I, I asked it not necessarily as a hypothetical, but against the backdrop of what you did outline in the fall economic statement, which was two promises where a fiscal anchor is concerned. The first, that you would lower the debt-to-GDP ratio in 24-25 and keep it, quote, on a declining track thereafter. The second, that you would get the deficit-to-GDP ratio below, oh, sorry, uh, below 1% by 26-27 uh, and keep it there. Does that inherently limit you, though, from launching any kind of program similar to those? So I am actually really glad that you put those two questions together because from my perspective, we have a fiscally responsible economic plan because we need to have the capacity to invest in Canadians. We need to have the capacity to invest precisely in things like early learning and child care. And fiscal responsibility means that those investments are sustainable over the long term. So that's why our economic plan it is really at its heart about investing in Canadians, investing to ensure that we have an economy that can deliver good jobs, people can count on, that supports them with things like early learning and childcare. And the way that we can continue to do that is by making sure that all of those plans and programs are contained, are you know, built on this fiscally responsible foundation. So you have the capacity, let's say, to sustain the programs that, that you have right now. My question is whether you will have the capacity going forward, now having outlined these fiscal anchors. And I'm asking you because what I have noticed in public opinion polling is that a lot of Canadians are saying, what's the, this government's vision for the future? And so if you're going to present big transformational projects that do come with a, a high price tag, I am wondering if this fall economic statement actually limits you from doing so, or maybe you're not so ready to make two promises. <laughs> Actually, I really believe our fall economic statement is about ensuring that we can continue to invest in Canadians. Because what I really believe makes things like early learning and childcare possible is that they are built on a sustainable fiscal foundation. Because that means we can keep on doing it year after year after year. And I really believe, Vashi, that the investments that we are making today and those are investments, you're quite right, that are ongoing based on things we launched in previous budgets. Those investments are going to deliver strong, sustainable economic growth that means we can continue to do more things for Canadians going forward. And I'm going to give you one more specific example, if I may. Um, and that is our economic plan about building the industrial economy of today and tomorrow. You saw, I know because you talked to me about this a couple days ago, um, that in the fall economic statement this week, we moved forward on our industrial transition measures, the tax credits, and those are real investments in Canada. They're going to create more jobs, they're going to create more growth, and they're going to mean that our fiscally responsible economic plan means we can continue to sustain the investments we have in place today and make more in the future. What is your level of, of adherence to that concept of fiscal responsibility? And I will invoke the promise that you made back in 2015, your government made, not you specifically, but the, the party that you're a member of, that the deficits would be modest in nature. You have outlined two very specific fiscal anchors. Are you willing to deviate from those in the future, or are you wedded to them? Um, that, I, I'm glad you asked that question, and actually that promise in 2015, um, for me, is very much a, a guiding impulse and philosophy of this fall economic statement. Um, I still remember standing up with the future
other than the leader of our party. Yep. Okay, so I have a fish toy to give away, but that's enough. No problem. So you say you would be ready? I hope so, because it's already over 10 minutes. Oh, shit. Yep. 